And hello, everyone. It's Thursday. We were off last week, but we're back today for our Thursday Let's Talk About Robot Trading webinar. We're going to talk about pivotal in-game adjustments. And if you're a sports watcher, you've heard that phrase way, way, way too often because announcers say it all the time. However, one of the main topics that I get asked about and one of the main topics I asked other people about is, okay, you've got a trading system. You've got a robot or a discretionary system, whatever you have, when do you know when to change? Because it's so scary when it loses. Our trading systems, when we lose, are so scary and they're our worst enemies. So it, the tendency is I want to change, change immediately. And I wrote about that a little bit yesterday in the weekly newsletter. We're going to talk about that today. We're going to get very, very specific uh, and we're going to talk about the heron. So that will be awesome. Uh, by the way, speaking of the weekly newsletter, if you are interested in receiving a, a newsletter email from me every Wednesday, all you have to do is go to scottwelsh.me and click that button and you get a free ebook and you get on that list. Uh, the list is growing quite nicely. Uh, I've gotten some very kind emails saying that it's their favorite email of the week. That's really nice for someone to take time out and tell me that. I just I started blushing. It was so nice. Uh, but hopefully it's worth your while. Um, I love writing it and I spend time on it and uh, it's free. And then you don't need to buy anything. So there you go. Let's talk about, though, that power of adjustments, those in-game adjustments. As I mentioned, Every sports announcer that's ever, you've ever listened to, especially in the U.S. I'm not sure how the more qualified announcers are across the world. <clears throat> but anyway, I don't like American announcers that much. But anyway, every announcer says that especially when you get to playoffs, so we're talking about high-stakes sports games, playoffs if you're talking about American sports or Grand Slams if you're talking about tennis majors, the key to winning in the playoffs, the keys to winning when it matters the most, the key is the ability to make adjustments from game to game or even point to point or set to set or first half to second half. The best coaches make adjustments and the worst ones don't. And when you're talking about coaches that need to be fired, it always comes up, well, they can't adjust. They can't adjust. Ah. In tennis, furthermore, Federer is known for his ability to adapt on the spot. Because he can do so many things, he can change his style. He can attack, he can defend, he can slice, he can topspin, he can play touch, he can do whatever. Of course, <clears throat> he didn't do that last night, now did he? And if you think I'm over it, I'm not. And I'm very, very angry because he played terrible and he played dumb. But anyway, I'm a fan and that makes me irrational and I am irrational. Uh, but Nadal is known for this, too. If you know your tennis, Nadal can switch. Um, he normally plays defense, but he can switch to offense. He can come to net. He can change where he serves. So this does exist, even though I'm kind of mocking the announcer for saying that it's the ones that can adjust the best. Or, that's actually true, right? The ones that can adjust are good. I'm not going to lie about that. But I like principles that are available in a multiple different genres. So you know, as well as I do, if you've read your business books on business titans, they will tell us that businesses that are long-term successful, and uh, what is it, Good to Great by Jim Collins, which was kind of funny because Good to Great, the first version, or In Search of Excellence, I guess it was, which was it? Not, either, either one, whatever, you know the book I'm talking about. In the first Good to Great book, all those bit or a lot of those businesses went bankrupt or did poorly right after his book. Like he picked the companies that should last and then they didn't last. And then he did a second book talking about kind of updating, right? I'm not making fun of Jim Collins. I'm just saying that's the way business goes. Anyway, you know what I'm talking about. It's funny though that they say that the ones that last the longest are the ones that can adapt. Remember, adapt or die, right? These are the principles. So announcers say it's sports, business, and I assume in trading, if you've ever read One Good Trade by Mike Bellafiore, if that's how you say it, Mike Bellafiore. Anyway, he's a discretionary trader, and he says just make one good trade, and he's always adjusting. Like he he says, have a playbook, and you got to have at least three or four or five different strategies in that playbook. And depending on the day and the stock you trade and the stocks in play, which you're going to trade, and that's adjust, 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 right? So this is everywhere. It's in trading too. It's all over the place. The best traders, coaches, athletes, businesses adjust, right? Well, 
let me ask you this. <laughs> if adjustments are the only things that matter, if the adjustments are the greatest, then how does this explain that restaurant in California or in Florida or wherever, in LA, New York? How do you explain that restaurant that survives for decades? There's a book I recently read about a restaurant. I think it's been in business for 70 years. I know there's a business or a restaurant in LA that's been in business for 50 years. I forget the name and I can look it up for you. It doesn't matter, right? And they have the exact same menu for 50 years. Wait a second. What? what? Where, where, where are the adjustments in that? Or how do you explain how much classic books sell every year? How do you explain that? How do you explain that there is a certain handful of books, and bigger than a handful actually, that are what they call perennial sellers? They sell every year. Did you know this? Are you aware of this? Did you know that the great Gatsby sold 500,000 copies every year and, and more than that in some years? I think last year it did even more than that, 2016. The great Gatsby sells 500,000 copies a year. There's no update to the great Gatsby, right? There's no adjustments to the great Gaps, Gatsby. They're not changing the story based on what's happening in 2017. They're doing nothing. And it sells 500,000 a year every year. How do you explain that? How do you explain the businesses that have been around forever? In short, an argument can be made, a very good argument, that adjustments should always be considered, but might be totally unnecessary and unneeded. So what are these people talking about? That's why I love it when people just say stuff and they don't think it through. Sports and I just say, there's teams that adapt. Well, what about the teams that just play their style and that's it? Aren't they successful, right? There are, are there teams that run a certain style and win over and over and over again? Hasn't the Brazilian soccer team been running basically the same paradigm strategy since the 50s and winning World Cups? Aren't they the most successful World Cup soccer team, football team, right? So it's not always true that you need to adjust, adjust, adjust. Sometimes you need to adjust not at all. Well, great. Then how do we know, right? How do we know if we need to change? If, it's, if we can't just blindly say we need to adjust, and you can't just blindly say, hmm, I'm doing this and I'm doing it for the next 70 years, then how do we know? Well, some things I think we can all agree will never, ever go out of style. If something is fundamentally sound, fundamental meaning timeless, works over and over, you don't need adjustments to fundamentals, good health, for example, right? Now, we can have a whole podcast. This isn't even a podcast. By the way, I'm thinking about doing a podcast. Anyway, we could have a whole show on what good health is, and we could maybe have different things in our good health diet. But I bet we could find something that's the same in everyone's that we could. Vegetables. Anyway, and I don't even like vegetables that much. If something is fundamentally sound, then no adjustments need to be made ever. Well, let's have some examples. Well, being nice to people doesn't need adjustments. If you're nice to everyone you meet, what are the chances of 100,000 people are going to hate you? Somebody might, right? Somebody, there's always somebody who might not like niceness, for example. But if you're nice to people, you don't need adjustments. You don't need to start being mean. In tennis, hitting the ball in doesn't need adjustments. Federer didn't hit it in last night very much, did he? Especially on that set point in the third set. <laughs> hitting the ball in doesn't need adjustments. How about leaving something better than you found it? Whether that's a campsite, a hotel room, a house, a restaurant, your place in a classroom, whatever. If you leave something better, your business, if you leave something better than you found it, you probably don't need to adjust that, right? And timeless principles don't need adjustments. If you find something that works and makes sense, you never have to change it. Have I given you enough examples? Are you buying what I'm selling? Do you believe me yet? I Hopefully, I don't have to convince you anymore that there are timeless principles that last forever. Well, that's my goal. If you don't know me, if you're just tuning in or watching me on YouTube or whatever, you should know by now or now you do know 
that my goal is to make trading systems that never, ever, ever need to be adjusted. I don't just throw data on a chart and test it and try to get something that will impress you. I don't do that. I spent, what, three or four hours today doing testing before this webinar, and that's not what I was doing. You know what I was trying to find? Something that works forever, right? Now, when I say works, doesn't mean it's going to be perfect forever. It's not going to be 110% every year. But we're talking about over the long term, over 3, 5, 10, 20 years and beyond, it makes money. You're better than when you were before. So how do you make a trading system that never needs adjustments? Well, you make something timeless. Did you guess that part, right? The items in the restaurants that last 30, 40, 50 years, they taste good. They don't need to adjust that. Why would that restaurant ever go out of style? Why? Well, here's the news. It will never go out of style if something tastes really, really good. You know how it would go out of style? If ownership changes or the chef passes away, a different chef comes in and they change it. If something's been around for 50 years, it's going to be around for 50. That's what the logic principles tell us. And that's what actual experience tells us. If something's been around, it's going to keep being around unless you change it. New chef, new ownership, something new is the only way that a good tasting restaurant will go out of business. Themes and classic books will always be around. The story of Great Gatsby was obviously what, 1910, 1920s? That's when it took place. Um, people are still reading it. 500,000 books are being bought every single year. It must resonate to someone. I just watched a Great Gatsby movie the other day. It's pretty good, right? It sucked me in. It sucked me in three different times just to watch a part of it. Themes and classic books will always be around. You want to know how Great Gatsby won't sell? They change the book, right? They add additions. They change it. So trading systems need to be structured in the same way. If we base our systems on timeless principles, we don't need to adjust. So what are some examples? We've talked about them, but I'm going to keep saying it till you memorize them. Buying at a deep discount. Value investing is never going out of style. Sometimes it sucks. Sometimes it's frustrating. But buying at a deep discount is always going to work in the long term. Trend following which I was working, part of that testing today was working on my new trend following course. Trend following is universal. Things trend. They always will. Remember, we have researched for over 500 years on trend following systems, and they work, right? Trend following will work forever. Getting into a trend in a pullback or during a pullback. When will that ever stop working? right? The trend is up. There's a slight pause, and then it continues going up. What are some examples of getting in on a trend and a pullback? What about Investor's Business Daily? How to Make Money in Stocks. Have you looked up that book? I've read it like 60 times. How to Make Money in Stocks by William O'Neill. Guess what they do? Cup with a handle. What is cup with a handle besides something that no one can he ever figure out how to do in real life? <laughs> Sorry, I don't understand this cup with a handle. I don't know what its fascination is, but Guess what it is? You go with the trend, right? It makes a, it goes down, and then it starts trending up. And then it makes a handle of the cup, which is a slight pullback after the trend has been violently up. And then it goes. And then you buy in a pullback, right? What is a bull or bear flag? It's a pause in the trend, and then it goes again, right? How many times have you looked up a trading system, and it had some sort of pullback? Any Fibonacci system is usually based on some sort of pullback to the 31 line or 61 line, right? That Mike Bellafori, One Good Trade Book, which is a fantastic book, almost, well, not almost, many of their systems are based on pullbacks, right? So Warren Buffett's value investing is never going out of style. Trend following research is never going out of style. Getting into a trend on a pullback is never going out of style, right? So making trading systems with one or more of those, in my opinion, which is right, haha. In my opinion, if you can get involved in the timeless principles, you should have a system that doesn't need to be adjusted. Okay, well, I haven't answered the question yet. When do we adjust? I'm pounding the table. Can you hear that? Anyway, when do we actually need to change? 
Well, we need to change when something unexpected happens. Okay, sports analogy. You have a game plan and something unexpected happens. Whoa, they're doing something that was not expected that they've never done before. That's a problem. Or we play a style that we've been playing for 10 years and we lose our quarterback. That's a problem, right? Quarterback hits, breaks a leg, right? Or the weather. We play a style, we're playing a weather situation that we've never played against, right? When something unexpected happens, we need to consider making a change. Okay, trading, what does that mean? If the testing looks like real life, then everything is fine. Losing means nothing. Pause for dramatic effect like I tend to do, to do. If losing is within your historical parameters, if you're going, hmm, in testing, it says I should have done this. Oh, in real life, I did that. They're both losing trades. Life goes on. Suck it up. I'm yelling at you, but mostly I'm yelling at me too, right? This is how, this is exactly what's happened for me because I've talked about the Hornet, been talking about the Hornet a long time. Why? Because I developed it and started developing in 2013. Now we're going on five years. And I, I, I haven't done a thing to the Hornet. I did hundreds, thousands, plural, of hours of testing first. But since that, I really haven't adjusted it. The only thing I've adjusted is my love for the Aussie yen. <laughs> And uh, I did some work on the Aussie dollar, um, and that was a long time ago, right? Uh, and I don't trade the Aussie dollar, and I wouldn't trade the Aussie dollar. I don't like the Aussie dollar. Uh, but anyway, I haven't changed these. Now, we're going on years, 2013, 2014, 2015, 2016. I'm not 17, right? I, I haven't changed a thing. Why? Because the Hornet is based on one of those timeless principles, okay? Another timeless principle is obviously trend following. Remember I gave the example of the slingshot, which is a trend following. It's a breakout, get involved in the trend type of system. I developed that. That was the first one in early 2012. I don't know if it's early, but it's 2012 for sure. That has been untouched and has been profitable all the time on the long. Well, I guess it did have one small losing year. Then we look at that the other day. Um, but overall, it's been way better than the market, way better than an index fund. And again, it's based on one of those trend-following principles, right? So wrapping it all up, the Hornet was tested on TradeStation. Thousands of hours went into it, timeless principle underneath it, and I haven't had to make an adjustment. I don't worry about TradeStation, okay? I don't worry about my TradeStation testing. And I realize that I'm one of the few people that on earth that can test Forex and TradeStation because TradeStation doesn't have Forex anymore. If you weren't involved in TradeStation before the Forex debacle, when they cut it, you don't have the platform. So I understand I have an advantage, or at least I have maybe not an advantage if you don't think so, but I have a resource that other people don't have. But I'm just telling you, I got my trading costs down to a science. I know how much a trade costs. I build that into all my testing, and the testing has been not as good as real life. Talked about that two weeks ago. Okay. But all that being said, what if it doesn't look like real life? Well, what is that? What does that look like? Well, which brings us full circle now to the current heron. How many times I need to say it, I am so invested in the heron. I want this to work. I think it can help people. I want to change how people invest. I want to change lives. Right, I do. I want this to change my life, but mostly I want it to change yours. My number one focus is I want regular people, normal people, to be able to do something simple that makes them retire right early or provides for their family. Right? This is a huge thing for me. Now, that being said, I keep saying that. When I created the Heron, the testing was done on only MT4. Well, I just said trade station, trade station. On, on the Heron, on the original Heron, I did not use trade station at all. It is the first robot I've ever done that way. Now, why did I do it? What kind of an idiot am I? Well, maybe a big one. That's up, for you to, up to you to decide. But the reason why is I wanted it accessible to everyone. Right. My second tier is if this works on MT4, then I can start developing things that can help people and they don't need to have TradeStation. I have a special resource 
if I can't make something on MT4 alone, then people are stuck depending on me, right? Anyone who cares to trade what I trade. Well, I don't want people depending on me. I want you to be independent. I want you to depend on you. I just want to help. <sighs> so I wanted it to be on MT4. That way I could develop more, I could put out more, and I could give you more tools, right? However, <laughs> here we are. I started trading the Heron on May 28, 2017, okay? That's when I went live. I, the account on my FX book goes past further than that. Well, the Hornet was on it before that. So the Hornet actually was winning. I was up in that, then I switched to the Heron. And where are we? Well, we're down. As I wrote in the newsletter yesterday, it's, is it down very much? No. I have it set for a possible 40% drawdown, and it's down 4%. Okay. I mean, it's not like this is catastrophic at all. But, 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 according to the MT4 backtesting from May 28th to now, this week, I think I did it through Monday, whatever, the original Heron should have lost 48 cents. Now, this is a very small trade size. I get this question. You can use any trade size you want. I'm doing it on small accounts because most people who email me are on small accounts. This could be instead of 0.12 lots. This could be 10 lots, 20 lots, one lot, okay? So don't say 48 cents, how am I going to live? Of course you're not, but this is a $1,000 account. It's not a $100,000 account. Multiply by 10 if you want bigger numbers, okay? So that could be $4,800 instead of 48 cents. Anyway, the original Heron should have lost 48 cents, okay? No big deal. You can see that it hasn't been a great period for the Heron. This happens. There are up to six-month periods where it's just not, it's just going back and forth, not doing much of anything. And then it has a huge streak up, right? It has massive years where you can make a boatload of money, and it has years that are nearly break-even, right? We don't know which one we're in. Historically, it looks phenomenal. But that doesn't mean every month is a grand party with fireworks shooting off. I can accept that. Right, back to the subject. 48 cents is what I should have lost, okay? Now, the Martingale Heron should have made 73. We're back to this again. Should we all be trading the Martingale? Huh. In the long run, the original and the Martingale tested out to be about the same. So isn't it interesting that the Martingale is just better in blah period? That's what conclusion we can, that, that's the conclusion we can draw. Martingale is better when things are bleh. Okay, so obviously the Martingale would have been great. But what about the TradeStation version? Remember in the newsletter yesterday, I retested on TradeStation only and got slightly different numbers than I got on MT4. So what did that slightly different? Again, it's not a big deal. It's not a big difference. But it was a tweak here and a tweak there. Some of it was exactly the same. But what did that TradeStation version do? It should have made $60. Hmm. Does that mean the TradeStation version is better? Hmm. That's a question that you need to decide for yourself, right? But obviously, according to the numbers. Okay. Now let's look at what my account has really made. What can you find with my FX book? Well, I've lost 61 bucks. That is not expected. If I would see something around a dollar loss, I'd be like, eh. I'd still consider going to the TradeStation version, right? Because it made more money in this period. But if it was about the same as my testing, I would be, this, we wouldn't even be having this conversation. But I've lost way, way more, even though it's <clears throat> not that much, right? It's 4%, <laughs> right? Uh, and I've added some money, right? I added some money to that account. That's why, hmm, 4%, why isn't it 40 bucks, right? I, I get it. I, I, hear you, I hear you. But um, I've added some money, so I've actually lost a little bit more. Anyway. 61 bucks is not expected. And remember what we said, if it's not expected, now we talked about why, all right? Well, the first reason why that number is bad is my errors. I've taken a few trades out early, my fault, not doing it again, okay? However, we had two humongous problems, <laughs> almost the entire reason that this is down. One, we had a winner that didn't take, right? So that's a 28 buck swing, right? 14 bucks in my account and $14 less of loss. So that was one. So that's a $28 swing. So we had a winner that just didn't take. My, I lost my uh, VPS connection. I logged off, logged off, logged back in. It's been fine ever since. No big deal. Okay. 
Then I had two trades finish on Sunday, which on paper should have been wins, and they weren't because of the freaking spread. So again, now a 28 more. So now we're at 60 bucks, right? <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? If we didn't have that Sunday spread widening and my VPS worked, I'd be almost back to even. Then you added my couple of mistakes, and you can see that without these mistakes, it would be very, very close, right? And then we had that trade on August 31st, which was the most unexpected. I set my inputs on MT4 for 59 minutes after. Why? Because I wanted to trade at the, exactly the top of the hour. On TradeStation, if you wanted to trade at the top of the hour, you put your inputs for top of the hour. So if you set your inputs for 12 o'clock, it will take a trade at 12 o'clock. Well, on the Hornet, if you set it for 12 o'clock, it doesn't take. It starts at 12.15. Well, that sucks. Oh, but if you put it at 11.59, it takes a trade at 12 o'clock. Great. Well, remember, the Heron was done with different coding methods because I did it instead of having a programmer do it. Every programmer is slightly different. So it took a trade at 59 minutes after. It is not supposed to do that. Guess what would have happened if it waited one more minute? It would not have taken the trade. TradeStation didn't take the trade. <laughs> MT4 testing didn't take the trade, but I took the trade in real life. So I needed to trade at the top of the hour. I only had it set at 59 after, so it would trade at the top of the hour, and it did the opposite. <laughs> that is unexpected, and that needs to change. Oh, how would how'd that trade work out? Loser. So if you take that trade out, you can see how my 61 bucks should not be 61 bucks. And if you're trading this, the Heron, along with me, hopefully you're doing way better than me. Two unforced errors by me, two or three unforced errors by the platform, and one huge unforced error is because the coding was different, and I did not know that. So, bottom line is, is there really reason to panic about the Heron? Well, no, right? If you make that input change and stop making unforced errors and stop getting a little bit unlucky with that spread widening, everything will be fine, right? This has not been a great period for the hair, and at least if you use the original inputs, okay? Or, as I mentioned yesterday in the newsletter, we could just switch to the TradeStation inputs, right? Using TradeStation inputs on MT4 robots has worked great. Remember all those thousands of hours I spent on TradeStation only, and then TradeStation discontinued Forex? When I switched to MT4, I used the same settings. I did not have to adjust. Oh, how has that worked out? Perfectly. Okay. When I go from TradeStation to MT4, so far in my experience, and we're talking about multiple years now, it's been fine. Doing MT4 by itself and going to TradeStation, not as good. You see what I'm saying? Hopefully this isn't confusing. I took my MT4 only inputs and put them on TradeStation. It was still good, but not as good. I did TradeStation inputs onto MT4, and it worked on both better. Isn't that interesting? Why is that? Well, who knows MT4, right? I think it's a quality of data. I just use what comes with it. I'm going to try purified data, which I don't, I didn't want to do, but I'm going to try it. So maybe that'll clean it up. And maybe if you have Dukas copy data that's clean, 99%, whatever it is, that might do it. But for whatever reason, TradeStation to MT4 for me has worked. MT4 to TradeStation has not. So why, why even bother with all this is my point. Why not just use the TradeStation settings for the Heron? transfer them over to, to the MT4 and just go from there. And now I have two platforms. I have MT4 testing to compare to real life and I have TradeStation to compare to real life. And that has worked out great for me. So what I'm saying is if you're already trading the Heron, switch that input, right? Which I've already talked, I sent out an email to all Heron members yesterday. Just change that input and just keep going. Or if you want the TradeStation settings, I put those in the course too. So now you have both. You have two different settings that you could use. Oh, you could open up two different accounts and trade them against each other. Mm, I just thought of that just now. Maybe I'll do that. But anyway, for me, because of my history, I'm switching over to TradeStation parameters, right? But like I said, keeping the old ones with that input adjustment would be fine. Here's the bottom line. 
Execution has been poor. That's why I'm down in the heron when I don't necessarily need to be. If I'm trading it, trading the original, actually, I would still be down. But execution's been poor, okay? Part of that's my fault. Clean it up. I have. Done. As I said, the old settings should be fine with one little tweak. The input wasn't doing what it was designed to do. You ask when you should make a change, the number one answer for me is make a change when the inputs aren't doing what it was intended to do. 59 after was supposed to get it to do what it's supposed to do. It didn't. So you make that change. Let me say that again. That, if you're talking about changing your trading system, whatever you trade, that's number one. Change when it doesn't do what it was supposed to do. My results were unexpected, right? Um, most of that, the truly unexpected one was the trade that took. That should not have taken, right? The others were not were unexpected because of the spread widening and because of a loss of connection, right? Um, bottom line is I don't plan on making any more changes. The Heron was built on timeless principles that I believe in. Unless something unexpected happens, I expect to run this Heron indefinitely for years, plural, okay? Like I just said, all if you're a Heron course member, you've got that email. It's in the course. It's at the bottom of the course. Go find it. Um, you can have the new settings if you like. Um, if you're haven't, if you're thinking about the Heron and you want to buy it, you'll have both settings in the course, right? But understand me, I'm not big into adjusting. I like the restaurants that have been around for 50 years. I like the teams that win every year. I like fundamentals. And my goal with my trading systems is to never change. That doesn't mean, however, I'm never going to be ready for an unexpected thing. I am going to be ready for something unexpected. Okay? Let's check, see if any questions or comments came in. And looks like good. Looks like everybody's doing good. Excellent. I was especially eloquent today. I, no one had any questions. <laughs> Here, quick, before we finish up, the Heron course is available. I've kept this on for several weeks now. Um, all the robots, too. Uh, just made some big changes, and those are in the course. All right. Um, I've mentioned September 1st being a big moment for me. I am a bit behind. Um, the day before we were supposed to travel, Jill was playing tennis and ruptured her Achilles. <laughs> So um, we went to the emergency room for six hours that day. Uh, that was a Thursday. And it was um, needed surgery uh, the following Monday. So uh, she just had surgery about a week ago. We were living in a hotel. It's a long story. For a week, over a week, about eight days. That was super fun. Um, yes, um, we're, uh, like I said, I was doing some stuff in Ohio for a little bit. So we're traveling now back to Florida. Oh, wait. Can't go to Florida. Hurricane Irma, super scary. Talking to Mr. Rob Booker, our friends, about the Houston stuff, super scary. I am so intimidated by hurricanes. So not going there either, right? So I've uh, basically been uh, homeless for the past two weeks, dealing with some chaos and some rough stuff. Um, but I can't tell you how excited I am for all the stuff that's going to happen. Um, I I'm not, just not going to go into it right now. There is a lot of stuff going on that I'm excited to share with you. All right. YouTube's up over 850 now, and that's where you can find all of these videos. Email me with any questions. Love to hear from you. Sign up for the weekly email list, and so on and so forth. That's all, everybody. It's great being back. We'll be back next week as usual. Bye for now.